Welcome back to another episode of Dive Into the Psalms. We are talking through Psalm 46 today. For those of you who don't know us, my name is Marion Clifton. I'm a student minister here at Sardinia Church of Christ. And this is Brett Parker. He is the senior minister here at Sardinia Church of Christ. And we're just putting together this, this podcast to review through different psalms as we go into this um, series, Dive Into the Psalms, this summer. I am super excited about today's psalm, Psalm 46. Definitely one of my favorites, but... Uh, having spent time just diving into the background and the context, um, I think it's going to be a great discussion. Yeah. You want to kind of give us a breakdown of what you discussed this past Sunday? Quick, Absolutely. Quick um, recap. <clears throat> so we're now in book two of, of the Psalms. So book one is Psalms 1 through 41. Book two is Psalms 42 through 72. And the a lot of the research I came across... Uh, mentioned the idea that the second book of the Psalms, this group of about 31 Psalms, could have been put together during um, Israel's or the Jews' exile in in Babylon. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that's when they were written, but that's when they were kind of compiled as this this collection is, is during the exile. And the reason for that is the use of the word Elohim for God. That's kind of the more formal usage. So a lot of scholars believe that the Jews would have used these psalms while they were in Babylon living Mm -hmm. in a pagan nation because using the more personal name Yahweh for God, they would never do that in front of, you know, Gentiles. They they just wouldn't. And so uh, a lot of them have said, hey, this is a collection of psalms that really express the collective voice of the entire nation. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's kind of one of the things going on in the background of Psalm 46. Another one we see that it was written by the sons of Korah, uh, who were a group of Levites. They were in charge of uh, carrying out worship and different you know, priestly duties yeah. in the temple. But there's an interesting backstory um, when we look at that name, Korah. So the original Korah actually was a contemporary of Moses. So he lived mm-hmm. hundreds of years before Psalm 46 was ever written. Uh, the sons of Korah, they aren't necessarily his immediate children, but they're, they're direct descendants of him. But they, they came along, you know, their great-great-grandchildren came along after yeah. him. But uh, Korah was not necessarily known for his faithfulness. So mm-hmm. lived during the time of Moses when they're in the wilderness, and Korah actually led a rebellion against Moses and oh, wow. Aaron and ultimately God. Yeah. So God had spoken through Moses and Aaron and said, I want you to set aside the Levites. They're going to be the ones in charge of carrying out kind of these holy duties and leading people in worship uh, in the tabernacle. Um, They're kind of the priestly tribe Mm -hmm. of God's people. But Korah didn't agree with that. And so he gathered about 250 men and kind of uh, led this rebellion. He opposed Moses um, and it eventually uh, led to God doing some pretty drastic things to, mm-hmm. to show that this was not okay. And so we're told that Korah and a couple other guys and their families were actually uh, swallowed up into the earth. Like the earth oh. split, it opened up, swallowed them, uh, and then fire came down. The other 250 men that were kind of on Korah's side, the fire just consumed them like that. And so... Mm. Um, you have these sons of Korah, these descendants of Korah, who had, I'm sure that's probably an unforgettable yeah, family had, story. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> probably the, you know uh, the the old home movies. They went yeah. through them and saw, oh, here's Korah's rebellion, right? <laughs> and so they had heard this story growing up, and so they know uh, a couple of things going into the writing of Psalm 46. And one, it's that God takes very serious this charge yeah. to lead His people in worship. Uh, But two, that they know God can cause the earth to shake, He can cause mountains to crumble, He can cause fires Mm -hmm. to consume. Uh, And when we look at Psalm 46 specifically, we see all of those elements kind of written into that. uh, Which is which is really cool. So, so what you're saying was like, so the sons of Korah are attributed to like writing it, but it was compiled around Babylon time. 
like the Berean Babylonian style. Yeah, so book book two of the Psalms, uh, we can kind of look as as uh, as those as this collection of maybe almost like more patriotic. Okay, you know, it's songs that everybody, all the Jews would have would have sang, and it's it's kind of a uh, um, an outpouring of the entire nation's heart. So, so was it like written during the time of Babylonian exile, or was it written during the time of the sons of no, Korah? No, so it was, it then... was written before. A lot of people believe that the sons of Korah were actually, they lived at the same time as King David, so okay. hundreds of years before before the exile. Um, but it was still written in the wake of some big national crisis or event. Okay. Uh, so... Um, we're not exactly sure what that event is. Psalm 46 doesn't really give us clues as to what had happened. Uh, you know, it could have been that they wrote this after, you know, David was was a military guy. He led lots of, of battles. It could have been that uh, they were attacked by a neighboring nation, and this psalm was written after God delivered them. Yeah. Um, what, could the, have... the Babylonian exile was like one of, I think, one of the last of the... Like exiles, if I'm correct, am, am I right on that, or am, am I wrong on that? Uh, wh- I can't quite remember. Like the order, like all of the prophets are like basically talking about different, like yeah. almost seasons of exile. And yeah, all, all like the prophets that, or, happen. Um, not necessarily all exiles. Yeah, but after the time of conflicts. David, you have the the northern kingdom of Israel that's exiled in 722 BC. Yeah, they're conquered by the Assyrians, and then the Judah, or where we get, you know, where the Jews lived in Jerusalem, they were conquered in 586 by, by Babylon. Yeah, so the, the uh, context is like one of those many conflicts, potentially. Yeah, it, 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 we're not exactly sure what happened here, um, but the psalm is meant to help people see the bigger picture and, mm. and maybe even um, cope with what had happened in the country, but also still have hope. Mm. Uh, yep. That God is with them. So I kind of liken it to. That rhymes, it's preachable. Cope what's that? and hope. Cope and hope. Cope and yeah, hope. that's that's a preacher talking. <laughs> gotta gotta have alliteration or rhyming words. Easy to remember. Yep. But I, I compare it to if you remember after 9 11, uh, Alan Jackson came out with a song called Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? Mm-hmm. And the whole song is, is kind of about our nation's response mm-hmm. to. Uh, the tragedy on September 11, 2001. Yeah. And so that's kind of how we can approach Psalm 46. It's very similar okay. to that. It's the sons of Korah um, are writing about something that happened in, uh, in you know, the people of God and their nation, uh, but they saw that he was still in control. Uh, he was uh, there to protect them, to see them through, to be their strength and uh, that, that they could ultimately hope in that. So that's kind of the, the, um, the background for Psalm 46, but how it compares to us, and mm-hmm. we can discuss this a little bit more later, but um, if this is a psalm that the exiles were singing regularly yeah. and that was providing them with hope, um, we, can, we can glean from that too, because mm-hmm. the New Testament says that we are exiles yeah. in this world, that yeah. this world Strangers. is not our home. Yeah. yeah, we're strangers, we're aliens, uh, you know. Like aliens as in like people who are right. foreign, not, not, not UFOs. space aliens. We're, we're not we're, green we're, people yeah. that come from space. We're, yeah, um, <clears throat> not that kind of alien. Well, that'd be kind of cool. It would be. Um, but that's, be not, that's not for this podcast. Be totally out of this world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we don't belong here, right? Yeah. That's the idea. And so how can we keep an eternal perspective mm-hmm. knowing that, this world is not our home and that bad things happen and that the world is constantly in chaos and it's shaken. Uh, how can we keep that eternal perspective? So Psalm 46 is a great text for okay. that. Let's go ahead and review Psalm 46. Go ahead and read it and uh, we'll dive in, talk about it for a little bit. And yeah. Uh, so Psalm 46, uh, it's uh, 11 verses long. So one through 11. Uh, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the, ma- for the, where the, where the Most High dwells. God is with her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob 
is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow, the bow, the bow, the bow, of the, I don't know that makes sense because bow and spear, the bow and shatters the spear. Um, he burns the shields uh, with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Um, well, one of the things that like, comes to my mind is like the word, I mean, obviously other than the comfort of refuge and strength is an ever-present help in trouble. And like you talked a little bit on Sunday about just like some of the chaoticness of like the past five years that we've gone through, (laughs) not just as a nation, but like globally, um, there's been a lot of chaos. Um, Culturally, there's been a lot of chaos just... um, just things that have happened with the pandemic. Um, and then personally, too, lots of crazy things happened um, with, I mean, on individual levels. Um, so this can apply on both levels, like on a national level, cultural level as Christians that we can, like, when we're going through troubled times. And Absolutely. then also personally when we're going through troubled times, that like God, God is our shelter. When, when you were talking, when you were literally just talking, I, I had this image in my mind uh, when I did, uh, when, when I was on a mission trip in Haiti, there was... Um, a rainstorm that just like came out of nowhere we were not expecting and like we were just randomly looking for like a place to go yeah and the person that was leading our group happened to know of someone nearby and it was like just this random like hut and um we just started running and like the rain was pouring and pouring and pouring and we literally just all huddled into this (laughs) hut um just to like get out of the rain but like that's kind of the image of like how chaotic it was, the rain was pouring, like when things are coming down, the storm is coming, like God is our shelter. Yeah. And that's what this this psalmist is really, really hitting at, which is really, really good. I, I think when we're in the midst of that, we don't see that until someone like slaps us in the face and tells us that, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah and... Um, but but I think with with God... The way we, the way we know that He is our refuge and our strength, and our help, is we we experience that. Mm. And so, when the psalmists say, "We do not fear," it's it's really this uh, contrast between go with what you know instead of what you don't know, mm-hmm. because fear is the anxiety that we experience when. Our future is unknown. When yeah. when it, it, we're fearing, we're, we're we're anxious over something that hasn't happened yet, and may not even happen. Right? Yeah. It's it's the unknown. But but with God, we we experience Him mm-hmm. as our refuge. We've seen His strength. Right. The psalmist is saying He has always been there to help us in times yeah. of trouble, and so. We can, we can know that through experience. We can know that through relationship. So go with what you know, yeah. rather than what what you don't know. Mm. Um, and I think like later on in verse eight, you know, we're told to come and see what the Lord has done. We're we're supposed to spend time thinking about all the the mighty things that He has done and is doing. Yeah. Uh, I came across a, a quote by one author. He said, uh, "The recitation of mighty acts of God." plants deep in the memory of his people the evidences of his care, protection, and providential rule. And so, to me, what the the psalmists are trying to do here mm-hmm. is give us an easy way to remember what we know, that yeah. God has been there for me, that he's been that shelter when I felt like the whole world was raining down or like I, I was facing this big storm, Um you know he has he has always been there. Um, he is mm. he is strength when I don't feel like I have any, or when we as a group feel like we are weak. God has been that strength, which echoes what you were talking about earlier when we were talking through this. Um, you were talking about the God of Jacob, Lord Almighty, the God of Jacob is our fortress and stuff like that. Like he echoes like what God has done through, like talking about like 
this is what God literally did, like yeah. through our ancestor Jacob. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Really good. Um, one of the things that like stands out to me when I'm thinking about this is like, honestly speaking, I would say that like as Christians, we have been so comfortable with being like the majority culture whether majority practice actually Christianity, even in the past like hundred years, like that's debatable. Um, but like, because there's just been this natural default, like it's just, it's been comfortable to be a Christian. Um, it's a little less comfortable now, uh, just to like have a conviction or an opinion or a thought on certain issues or any issue really, um, to have an opinion at all. Um, and so I think Christians have this tendency. I know, myself even included, like, would naturally resort to being afraid uh, and operating in that fear, which, like, comes into, like, the whole fight or flight thing. Like, you're either going to choose to fight, stand your ground, or you're going to choose, like, to flight and run um, because you're afraid rather than operating in faith, which this is what essentially it's telling us to do. Like, God is your refuge. God is your strength. Like, you may not feel very strong. You may feel very weak. You're not the one that's strong. Like, God is your strength. God is your refuge. Like, so don't operate from that fear. Operate from, um, from your faith. There's actually a, um, I did a lot of research, um, in the past couple of years, just on um, the next generation, and it's even more so. Each generation as they go by, um, it's less and less Christian cultural default, um, where like the culture is primarily Christian. So like the worldview of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, like it's not primarily Christian. Like they are growing up in a post-Christian world. And so this guy, David Kinnaman, wrote a book called um, Faith in Exiles or Faith in Exile. Uh, and he's talking about like this idea of like how as followers of Jesus do we navigate the world like that he calls digital Babylon, like comparing like to the idea of them, the ancient Israelite people like in Babylon. Yeah. Like, if we're exiles and we're in a world that's not our own, like how do we actually navigate in that? And he talks about these five pillars on how to actually do that and how to live that out. Um, and that's how we operate, not in fear, but like operate prophetically, if that's the word you want to use, like operate intentionally, operate in an offensive way rather than like um, reactionary, like being intentional about navigating life, navigating culture, navigating just the things that are in front of us, and, and training our, our kids to yeah. actually do that is a, is a huge, huge thing because the culture is not going to default to teaching them that. <laughs> if we're not teaching them that, then no one is. The culture is discipling them somewhere else. So they're, I don't know, that, that's a whole other tangent. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as, as disciple makers, we have to keep in mind Jesus told us to to go out into the world and make disciples. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times it seems like when Christians feel like um, the world is against them, they're met with resistance, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just th- there's bad things happening around them, the tendency is to retreat to the church, mm-hmm. right? Or, uh, you know, the culture is changing, it's not... It's not primarily Christian anymore. So let's start our own subculture. Let's have our own Christian movie theater yeah. or our own Christian grocery store or our own Christian bookstores, whatever it might be. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so we're treating the church as that refuge and that fortress rather than God and our mm-hmm. relationship with Him. Um, and there's a distinction there because uh, Jesus told us to go make disciples, not go make our own Christian subculture, mm. right? In fact, when we look at um, uh, the prophets and when they're in Babylon, Jeremiah is telling them, hey, plant yourself in that culture. Go be the uh, difference makers. Go be the ones sharing God's love. Like he's saying, don't uproot yourself and isolate yourself or, you know, hide in a little mm-hmm. bunker while you're in exile. Uh, plant some roots because yeah. this, even though this world is temporary, this is your home for now. And I want to influence the world through my people. Yeah. God's saying the same thing to the church today. Um, yeah. That that's what it, that's what it, God is our fortress, um, but we, we are the army that's claiming mm-hmm. background for Christ um, by making disciples one on one, right? By by transforming the culture, by transforming hearts one at a time. Yeah. I, I think naturally like because of that sense of 
fear um, that we can have in any context, not just like because Christianity is a, a, a minority culture, like in that sense, or co- we're like, this, I heard this guy describe it as like a cognitive minority, like the ideology is in the minority. Um, but like that applies to like everything, like uh, diagnosis you receive or um, mental health, uh, like situation that you're walking through and trying to really wrestle with. Um, if we allow the fear to consume us, like, again, our natural response for fear is fight or flight. And if we respond in that way, we're responding in a way that is contrary to the way that we could respond if we're responding in a way that Christ is our refuge and Christ is our strength. Yeah. And living from that faith rather than being controlled by our scenarios or right. our situations. And I think the, the psalmist kind of paint that picture in that middle section where they're talking about there's this river and there's you know the city of God and <clears throat> just the the turmoil that's going around us should not affect the peace within us mm-hmm. like as Christians we have access to peace and we're called uh, to experience peace to be peacemakers um, and so we don't we don't get drawn into uh, the chaos and the worry and the anxiety and the fear, mm-hmm. at least as easily, uh, because we have a peace that comes from God. And I, one uh, commentator I, I read, uh, he said that river in, in verse 4, it alludes to the graces and consolations of the Holy Spirit, mm. which flow through every part of the church, gladdening the heart of every believer. Um, and so... The fact that again, this is a this is a text. This is a psalm for the entire community. It's a song that all the people of of, of God, all the community of faith, were meant to sing. Uh, same with with us as Christians. Like we all have the same Spirit. Mm-hmm. He's in us. He flows through us uh, like this river. And so we should we should all collectively express this peace to the world, even even during times of trouble. And then it also, he mentions the city of God, which for the psalmists in, in uh, you know, ancient Israel, of course, mm-hmm. the city of God is Jerusalem, yeah. right? Now, 21st century Christians, American Christians, we don't live in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Most of us have not been to Jerusalem, I would imagine. Um, but for us, the symbolism there is... There is a new Jerusalem, mm. right? There's, uh, we're promised that Jesus is coming back. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that He's making all things new, and there is a there's a new Jerusalem, and so that helps us to keep an eternal perspective mm-hmm. when bad things are happening around us or when society is, you know, crumbling and, and falling apart. Yeah, and, um, we're we're able to go. You know what? It's really hard now. But I know this is not the end of the story. The end yeah. of the story is, you know, we get to spend eternity in the new city of God, in this new heaven and new earth that Jesus is preparing for us right now. Yeah, and something you mentioned too about the Holy Spirit, like really if you look at it, like you're looking towards the future, the future hope, all this kind of stuff, like, well, yeah, that's the future, but like the Holy Spirit is for now. And really the Holy Spirit is the, the beginning of that process. Like yeah. it call, like Scripture calls us, if those of us who are in Christ, new creations, because the Holy Spirit is doing work to create the new creation right. within us, like kind of like the new Jerusalem in the end. But like that process of new creation has already begun internally inside of us. Right. So like that but river it's not over. of like, yeah, it's not over. Like uh, but that think, promise think, is here. The hope is Yeah, there, there's... Tangible. Um, it's... Uh, I, forget which verse it is now where it says he's he's he makes war cease mm. right so it's the idea that it's a process jesus is still making war cease right now uh, jesus is still bringing peace to your life right now so it, it doesn't mean that um you know the second you declare hey i'm following jesus that your life is going to be completely peaceful nothing nothing bad or chaotic is going to happen or if it does that you'll immediately experience yeah. peace he's he's working in the world just as much as he is working in your individual mm-hmm. heart right now in fact I, I think it's verse seven so the psalmists refer to God with two different names they call him the Lord of hosts is he's with us 
But then they say, the God of Jacob is our fortress. And so the Lord of hosts kind of conveys this idea that he is the Lord of many. He's the Lord of all. He's the king of the world. Hmm. And yet he's still the God of Jacob. He is still a very personal God who cares about each and every one of us I just notice he repeats that in verse 7 and 11. Yes. To emphasize the... It's kind of like a chorus repeating it. Yeah. Yep. But it shows the... That God is not too big or too busy for any one of us. Um, he He cares deeply about every individual, even though He's busy, um, you know, uh, moving kingdoms around and, and accomplishing accomplishing His purposes and in the entire world. Yes, yeah, <laughs> ceasing wars. But at the same time, He He still cares about yeah. Brett. He still cares about Marion, and He's uh, intimately, intricately involved in our lives. Mm. That's really good. What so practically speaking, you, you obviously you gave us an action step on Sunday, of uh, being still, um, and I mean that's the same. Like that's what the psalmist is calling us towards. Is like, obviously recognize and praise God for being your refuge and your strength, um, and like your fear doesn't have to control you because you're you're in a safe place, even if it seems feels chaotic. Mm-hmm. Like so, it's like be still. Well, and that that the command to know he is God, right? Because again, the knowledge is what gives us confidence. Mm. When I know that God is in control and he has proven himself to be trustworthy, he's proven himself to be my strength when I'm weak, he's proven himself to always be there uh, helping me. You know, he is that safe place I can run to, um, when I when I know that, and not just head knowledge, but yeah, when that's was, moved to heart experience. I was gonna right? say, I think like from my understanding, like when you're thinking in like like Hebrew like mindset, like the idea of knowledge is as much physical experience as it is cognitive knowledge. Yeah, like honestly, more so physical experience than anything. Like you right. know, like <laughs> well, and you know, for for us in English. No, it just it, we just have one word for it. Yeah. Other languages, though, lots of other languages, there are many different words for no. Like I can know something factually. Yeah. But there's also the idea of of knowing um, through experience, knowing someone personally. Like so, it, yeah. it's more than just about facts. Well, it's about relationship. We tell our kids all the time, like, don't touch fire. Like if we have a campfire, <laughs> let's build or something like that. Like, but that's still a co- like a cognitive thing for them. They've not actually touched fire, but I have. Like yeah. I've actually not intentionally. I'm you not know crazy. Fire like I know it way. hurts. <laughs> it hurts, and that's knowing it. And yeah. like know that He is God. Know that He is our shelter. He's your protector. He will take care of you. Yep. And and I think that's um, a lot of the directive. There is, uh, it's, it's He's not telling us to pause everything we're doing and start reading the Bible. That's not how we. Hmm. Uh, you know, necessarily in that moment. We're not just learning facts about God, but he's saying, um, quit coming up with all these reasons why you should be afraid and consider how great God is and mm. remember what he has done. And and it's that ex- experiential relational knowledge that will help us find confidence when the rest of the world seems to be falling apart. Mm. The image I just had in my mind was um, Peter stepping out of the boat. And Jesus calling him out, like, mm, yeah. and how chaotic the waters were, and Jesus grabbing his hand because he's sinking, and yep, that's good stuff. That's, that's a good picture of it. Yeah, but yeah, that that's what this psalm is calling us to. That's what Psalm forty six is all about. God is a refuge. God is our safe place, no matter how crazy things are. So be still, know that, understand that, learn that, um, reminisce on it, remember it. Um, do you have any last thoughts from Psalm 46? I think, again, just as 21st century Christians, um, that we, re- we keep in mind that God is our refuge, that we can, we can retreat to Him, we can find uh, protection and comfort, um, but as collectively as his people, God's desire is to heal us and mature us mm-hmm. so that we can confidently go out into this world, into this land where we've been exiled for a season, right, for a short time, yeah. 
um, for this very temporary life and have the confidence to, to tell the world about how great our God is, right? And to, to love others like Jesus has loved us. Um, if, if we don't have that confidence, then we're going to easily fall back into fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, if, but if God is our strength, if he's our refuge, and we allow that knowledge that's based on off of our love and trust for him because we've experienced his goodness, then we can, we can move forward mm-hmm. without fear. Good. Love it. Yep. That is uh, Psalm 46. Um, if you are in the area and you don't have a church family, we would love to uh, meet you. Uh, we would love to have you this Sunday, 10 a.m. Uh, otherwise, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, grab our app in the App Store. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next week uh, when we talk about the next song. See you.